thank you for your interest in telling stories in paint and words. This video was taken of one of a series of workshops run by Bob and Ruth Brandt to raise funds for Voices Charity. Voices was founded by women with lived experience, dedicated to providing recovery support and advocacy for people affected by domestic abuse. The charity is also a platform which enables the voices of people with lived experience of domestic abuse to inform and improve service provision in response to their needs. If you would like to help support Voices, please follow the links to their website and head to the Support Us page where you can make a donation. Telling Stories in Paint and Words is a unique workshop exploring the processes shared by both creative writing and developing a representational painting. Bob Brandt is a painter, tutor and writer represented by the Gallery in Holt, Norfolk. His paintings have been widely exhibited and included in the annual exhibitions of the Royal Institute of Oil Painters and the Royal Society of Marine Artists at the Mal Galleries in London. He is a former president of the Institute of East Anglian Artists. Ruth Brandt is a writer and creative writing tutor. Her stories have been nominated for international prizes and her prize-winning short story collection, No One Has Any Intention of Building a Wall, is published by Fly on the Wall Press. If you're interested in following this workshop at home, you'll need painting materials, paper, paints, here we use acrylics, brushes, and a small washing up sponge. For writing, you'll simply need pen and paper. Telling stories in paint. My particular interest, as Nigel knows, many of you know, is painting uh, pictures with people in them. Because as soon as you have, I'm not too keen on adding the dog in the country walk feature, which people do to give a sense of scale. Uh, what I do like, as soon as you put two people into a painting, you start thinking necessarily about the relationship between them. Are they strangers? Leave it to the viewer to make that story up. And I think the co that's a common element in writing and in, in painting, is that we, we, that's the writer and the painter, produce an image for you to look at or a piece of writing for you to read, but we generate it and then it's for you to interpret it. As we grow older, we have more experiences of life and we have more experiences about relationships between people. We like being in crowds, we don't like being in crowds. So, when it comes to the painting bit, you may think I'm going to paint a picture. I'm not. I'm not going to teach you how to paint. Most of you can paint anyway, so that there's a waste of time doing that. And most of you will have your own individual style. What Ruth and I are talking about is the commonality, the way in which people like us get the idea to produce something which we can then turn into a finished painting or a finished piece of writing. Um, so you, you'll be shocked, shocked by the, the video I'm going to show you because you won't recognise what it is. It's going to be a mess. That mess was in my head when I was painting it. It wasn't painting. I was using photographs for reference. Uh, here's a picture. This is actually the photograph I'm using. This was taken in Rome one evening. I think we were looking for a place to have a supper. And here we are. We've started making the mark. I have started making the marks. No idea what that is yet. If you think about the photograph, what on earth's going on, you think? In fact, it's a sort of struct. There are structural marks. And so I'm saying, perhaps I'm saying to myself, this painting must have some structure of some kind. And I use a dark colour because it's, oh, here I'm doing something. And I'm using a sponge. Now you find you've got a sponge on your desk, which I would encourage you to use for this stage of your painting. That might be that chap in the foreground with a red top on, I'm not sure. Oh, that might be a woman further back who's wearing a blue top. I don't know. It's not related to anything, but this, these marks are now beginning to be structural marks. They're different in colour, aren't they? These are warmer colours in a sense. They're much more structural. We're now starting to look through a frame into something. And I'm, think, I'm just thinking that. I've got to have a frame for my painting. I'll have to put things in it. Oh, gosh, did, did very well there. 
Now I've got it gone to a brush now and using a white colour because this is why the advantage of having the grey paint is, and of course some colour on already, I can use now this as a drawing device. This is a drawing stage beginning to be um, a structure, a painted structure of the pictures I saw it. So it's fairly easy. I'm just picking up on bits of highlight which I see in the photograph. That could be the shoulder of that chap in red, couldn't it? That could be a tabletop, possibly. I don't know, really. Is there somebody over there? Oh, that's completed that bit. That's fairly chaotic. You see what I meant by mess? It's a mess, isn't it? Uh, I, I've got some uh, flesh sort of colour there going on. There's some bloke's head there, I think. So we're now, we can now recognise, if, even if we came at this stage, you recognise there are people in this, com in this conversation piece. It is a conversation piece. And the, the, if you use orange or a pink colour in your paint, we'll identify it immediately as a human head or human body. And so you can do very simple drawings of people with an orange dot and some lines which are arms and legs and stuff. Now, to define it more carefully, I've gone now back to a pure black colour. It's not black, it's Payne's grey. And I'm drawing in the sort of negative spaces there's a negative space. I think probably going to show the shoulder of that chap. And as I go on, you'll start to see, well, that could be a person. What on earth is that? That's some kind of structure. Straight lines are man-made structures. We know that. They don't occur in nature. A tree will be bent. This, that, that could be the top of a chair. Things are beginning to... I'm giving you more information for you to work with in your brain and think what it might be. This is not how you would paint it, because your painting would be different, and your interpretation, if you're a different person, would be different too. Oh, somebody else popped up there somehow. What's happened there? You see, I'm looking at the photograph, but I'm not in fact copying the photograph. I'm sort of saying, what's next? But it's a sort of negative what's next. It's not a positive, careful what's next. It's not a proper painting. It's notes about where things might be, what things might be important, what things might not be. There's another person here, I think, coming in. Oh, gosh, somebody else there. Didn't see them before, did we? Gosh, there's two people there now. Gosh, how did that happen? Or maybe that's not. Maybe that's his big dog sitting on a chair. It, it, not a dog-shaped head, is it? There's clearly a building now. We can see a building developing using a brown colour, changed colour now, because it's a fit up with black and white and stuff. See what happens now. We're probably about uh, two-thirds of the way through the paint, this painting, this note-preparing painting. Oh, we've got an awning, I think, there. What's happened on that right-hand side? Not much happening on the right yet. But having put that line in, there is a bit something light on the right, isn't there? But I'm much more interested in the left-hand side so far. What's happening there? I, I've, I've picked on a photograph out of, out of many, which I think might make a painting. So this is a tryout, if you like, a trial, a, a test flight. So now we've got a lot more information. And I'm going back to the white colour to redefine things which I've defined before. So now there's somebody beyond the man with the red top. But it's becoming much more complex. It's still a mess. I'm not embarrassed by it being a mess. And you mustn't ever get into the situation of being critical of your work at this stage. This is an experiment. If it works, you can carry on and finish this off as a painting. You may just stop if you want to. And there we are. That is the finished painting that I've done. Let's see if I can see what the studio painting looks like. Oh, there's a studio painting. So a lot of the elements you've seen are there, and some bits are missing. A lot of artists lay out their palette into two halves, a warm side and a cold side. Useful thing to have browns, reds, oranges one side, and then greens, blues the other. And you bal that balance between the two, like the balance between the dark and the light, is part of the storytelling. 
And uh, yes, you're quite right. The, the, the color tone, the color heat is very important. And it's something which you bear in mind. You don't have to use any of these tools. Yes, I think it was all about relationships. I think it was, I'd, I've done a lot of restaurants, cafes and pubs. I uh, did like pubs very much. Ah, well done. Do not use water with acrylic paints. The, the, you will have water in your pot. The point of wetting the brush for acrylics is to allow the brush to pick the paint up and deliver it. If you use a dry brush with acrylics, you'll get a drag mark, always. You can't get a decent mark. But it, it, you must not get the, the paint wet. You can have the brush wet, but not the paint wet. Very often, very often I do, and I have them in a special order, which I won't tell you, but it goes around to roughly from dark to browns to greens and blues and things over the top. Yes, I do that because it's easier to know where the color is. Yes. And, and also, you would, eventually what happens on the palette is you get a mixture, flesh, for example, of yellow ochre, orange, and cadmium red and white, which with a touch of cobalt blue gives you a whole range of flesh colors. And so you tend to get clumped areas on the palette. That's why it's good to put the colors around the edge. You always see them around the edge. And the, the middle bit's the mixing bit. Telling stories in words. This telling stories in painting and words has far more in common than we first, first think. For a start, we talked about making a mess with the painting and I hope you all felt that sort of sense of freedom and liberation when you're putting your marks down on the paper. All, all pieces of art, whether it's painting or whether it's writing, the first things you do on the paper is you really make a mess and it's the writer's way of feeling their way into a story in the same way that you were feeling your way into the painting. You make a mess on the way to having a perfected painting. With writing, you make a mess on the way there. Indeed, Hemingway, Ernest Hemingway says of, of um, writing, the first draft of anything is shit. So that sense of freedom I want you to take in that you had with that painting where you thought, oh, it doesn't matter, I'll just put that there for now and I can come back and sort it later. And often through those messy marks, you find something that you wanted to say that wasn't in the original painting. The second thing that Dad was mentioning during his, um, mentioned during his talk was that your take on that painting is your take. You, another person would have looked at that photograph and they would have found something completely different. They might have wanted to play with the tones, for example, rather than the actual subject matter. Someone else might want to, to actually make a story out of a, one of the people pictured in the painting. And it's exactly the same with writing. You can have exactly the same situation, the same um, given to a number of writers. And it's once they start to write it, they are adding their experience, their interest, their knowledge, all the rest of it into the story they want to tell. You are the only person who can write that story and there's no one right story to come out of anything. Details. Uh, as Dad was painting, doing the painting, he, he was going to put in great big sort of areas of colour and you could not for the life of you see what was going on there. And then it was as the details were added. As the bit of blue was added, you thought, ah, that's probably a dress. That's not a natural colour. It's probably a dress or a piece of clothing. There's probably a person there. As the outline, very rough outline was added, 
you could think, oh yes, that's probably a person there. And you can see, once you start picking out the details, you will start drawing your attention as the artist, the painter, to that. And it's the same with writing. Once you start adding the details in, it's those are the bits that we are asking the, the viewer, the reader, to take note of. Which is where we move on to less is more which is what we were, in, were looking at, um, Dad and I, when we were thinking about the theme for this, this session here. If every person or object that is in that photograph were represented fully on your painting, then it would be, yes, it would be a very nice photographic um, paint, uh, painting, and that's absolutely fine. But we're not telling a story through it. If I said, Henry looked round the room, ten men in total, three wearing blue suits, three in grey and four in black suits. Two of them were, were, were double-breasted suits and one of the ones with a double-breasted suit had black hair that was greying at the edges. They sat round an oval wooden table covered in a file and some pens and some papers and mugs and a bottles of water, all looking back at him. He looked at his own grey suit and brown shoes. One had a scruff, scuff where he'd kicked the curb on his way here and then up again at the gun lying on the table. Everything is described in equal detail. Henry looked around the room. Men, middle-aged, in suits, all paused as though interrupted. On the table in front of them lay a gun. You see, what I've done there in words is pick out the important bits that are important to the story. If it turns out later on that his shoe was scuffed is important, then that can go in there. Somehow I'll sneak it in. But you can see how less is more. But less is more not just for the writer, but for the reader as well. And this is what's really important. It's what's not there as well. It's as important because as we are reading, we are adding the details in. So if, for example, I gave you an image, I'm giving you this image to think about, a young girl in a yellow dress holding a dripping ice cream. If I said to you, where are we? If I said to you, what's the temperature? If I asked you, who else is around? You will each have added to that image subconsciously without realizing you're doing it. You're creating a far bigger image in your head from a few specific details. This is what you're doing in the painting. You're, add, you're putting a few marks on the paper which, to which the, um, the viewer will be adding the smells, the sounds, they'll be adding the feeling of the air, they'll be adding all this sort of stuff. And we often don't realise that we're doing that. We are giving the reader and the viewer an opportunity to enter into the story world, enter into the picture. What painting and writing have in common? some sort of inspiration. You can get painting inspired by photos. You've done that. You're going to do writing inspired by photos in a minute. We're going to work out how to do that. You make a mess to begin with in both, both um, forms of storytelling. The painting is unique to the painter. The story is unique to the writer. Uh, details draw attention and it's the absence of details that allow the reader, the, uh, the, the viewer in, and less is more. You do not need to give all the details, in all, all, all the information in order to allow someone into the story. When I'm writing, I say, allow your writer, reader to add at least 50% of the story. Make, make that space, make that negative space available in your writing as well. I'm now going to talk you into the writing exercise you're going to do. And I'm going to ask you a few questions about the painting that you've been working with. You may want to note these things down as you go through. I go through the questions. You may not want to note them down and just have these questions hanging in your head. However you work is fine. But I'm going to ask you about um, four questions just to think, get yourself thinking yourself into that photograph again. And then I'll set you writing. I'd like you to make, take another look at the photograph that you've been working with. And I want you to just note, what is your eye immediately drawn to? And when you've thought about that, I would like you to think about the most striking feature of that person or thing. It could be a streak of light across them or the colour of the clothing or the way that the hand hangs loose. Try and think about seven things about that, that um, person or thing that has attracted you most. When you've done that, I'd like you to fill in the world around that object or person or thing. 
What are the colours or shadows around? What are the people or noticeable objects? Is this a rural or an urban setting? This is just where are they? What is the world around this, this person or object that you're talking about? And finally, I'd like you to go into your imaginations now and think about the things that are not visual. Think about any smells that there are. Think about any touch, the air against the skin. What, even if you've just got clothes, the person's just standing freely or the thing. What about the, the um, clothes, how the clothes might feel on the body? Think about the ground under the feet. Think about any sensation of touch. Any noises, there's lots of noises. Every scene is always noisy. Think past the obvious and the obvious and think about all the noises. And if it's appropriate, are there any tastes involved? And finally, I would now like you to write a piece about that thing or person, whatever it is, just write a piece and it can simply be putting ands between everything you've written down just to make a, put that into one thing or it can be just seeing where the flow is now going and not including anything of what you've written down at all. Whatever you want to make of it. You've got five minutes, I will set a timer and I will give you a warning after four minutes to say you've got a minute left. You are not trying to write a story in the same way you weren't trying to produce a finished painting. What you are doing is exploring ideas for a story in the same way that you were exploring that in the painting. I started off with that. Um, I was attracted to the woman that was sitting on the bench who seemed to be just, I don't know, lost in thought. And the signal man for the train, really, as um, life was bustling by. And then I went on to another photograph. Um, again, I, I saw the woman there um, on the right-hand side. And I put it together that this was the same person um, and maybe two parts of it, the continuation of the story. For so me, the initial bit was, that's a very modern station, right? And Sheringham is an older station, which is probably more of the past. <clears throat> Mary started uh, off to the railway station early morning. The weather forecast had said overcast with the possibility of rain. To Mary, that seemed as to be more than about the weather, but how her day was going to unfold. She sat on a bench at Sheringham Station, awaiting her train, people watching as the world went by. The email sent by her old school friend suggested a meeting, a chat over coffee. It was a few months now since Peter's wife Anne's funeral. Anne had been a close friend of Mary's. The funeral was difficult, an atmosphere with people whispered. How could she show her face, the marriage breaker? But that wasn't her story at all. Wow, excellent. I want the next episode. <laughs> yes. We're going to run the same course next weekend. <laughs> wow, thank you. So, Doug, do you want to talk about... Well, the I, do, yes, I mean, they're, they're both railway stations, which is incredible, isn't it, with the amount of work you put in. But the, also the uh, important thing is the loneliness of the person because you've carried the character across and you've, you've isolated her from that figure to that figure. You've already told, given us a background, she's a woman on her own. And perhaps from the colours, not dreadfully happy, you know, that something's going on. But they're both very active scenes, and the energy you put into the painting is remarkable. I don't know how you do it in the time. Excellent, both excellent paintings. Yeah, and the, the idea that the day has altered her mood and her expectation of mood is it's key. 
we we do it naturally as in, in in terms of human beings if it's a little bit gray outside we often think oh it's not gonna be a good day and so what you've done is you've used that in the writing to reflect her expectation of the day uh, which is completely and we all relate to that and so it's that common human experience that we're relating to right at the start she's in this situation and she thinks this thing, this might not go as well. It's not raining, so it might be not be uncomfortable, but it might, might not be as good as, as she'd imagined. And so you've got that sort of sense right at the start of her a particular emotional, her emotional status is very clearly shown. And then you give the backstory, and you hinted at enough of it. You didn't say, to begin with, that she is this woman, but she found the, the funeral difficult. And um, then how dare she turn up, that woman. We slow, you're slowly revealing relevant information about that character, uh, that person in this story. A fascinating story. And of course, we all want to know that hook is brilliant. It's not, the, it's not that that is the important part. There's something more important going on than this. And that, to, to me, is quite a big story. And then there's more to it than that. And that is what we want to do. We are curious creatures, human beings. We want to know more. We're going to want to know more about her. Brilliant, Jane. God, thank you very much indeed. And this worked really well. What struck me first about the photograph was the sheer immensity of the building and the um, soaring stonework and columns and colours um, and that really was at hand of course the uh, contrast between light and shade so that was my overall feeling the people I really hardly took into account yeah anyway so that's yeah. a problem. Really? That's what um, this little... Yeah. Okay, so let's listen to the writing. Um, outside, the heat was oppressive. The midday, brightly shining sun had beaten down mercilessly, almost paralysing any activity that might be contemplated. Passing through the massive oak door of the cathedral, she experienced the most striking difference. Here it was cool and dark, with beautiful stone pillars soaring upwards into the dimly shadowed heights. Her thoughts and spirit, too, immediately soared upwards in the calm stillness. The other people there had no impact on this overwhelming feeling of peace something she thought lost after last week. Ah, another backstory. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Dad. Well, I, I, what, what one has captured is my feeling about the place exactly, that the people are insignificant compared with the history and the majesty of the building and all that tons of work at great expense put into producing this temple and and people just wander around <laughs> taking selfies which i said to molly it seems extremely odd to me but she's caught the majesty of the building look at the vertical lines mm -hmm. and the little people mm -hmm. and they were totally whereas you think this is a community building exactly. they're all they're all separate from each other they don't interact at all because they're busy getting around taking their pictures there's just no relationship between them. And those who come in a group that are in a group, but otherwise they're on their own. And how many are tourists? Look at the backpacks and stuff. And I feel Molly's caught that mass of the building. And of course, trans I introduced a character into it with the woman coming in through the doors. So we're now, you've drawn us into the story. We, we, again, we want to know what happens next. Will she, will she face conversion? What, in terms of the writing there, you've absolutely mirrored what you've done in the, in the painting there. You've taken the character out, you sh showing me the situation as she sees it, just in the same way that I'm, I'm, as the viewer, I'm looking into the painting and I'm seeing this. 
it, the character is looking in on this life because the heat and oppre the oppressive heat that you created in the, your first opening description, it was a really wonderful description. She goes inside and she's cool. She's not, she's, she's sort of sitting here in her head and all these other people are immaterial. What the only important thing to her in terms of the writing is the fact that it's cool in here. And these, all these people, they're just getting on. And it feels to me like she has written herself out of life at the moment. It feels to me like she's absented herself and she thinks she could walk through a room and no one would notice her. And that's the effect you've created with the writing in there. You've got this sense of she is absent from life. But then at the end of it, you again, you've got this massive great big hook and I want to know more. I don't know if you know where it's going, Molly, do you? Not yet. No. no. It's spinning around in there. Yeah. yeah. What I would do if I were you is not think too hard about it. Just try and get back into that flow when you get home and see what happens. Because sometimes we can kill an idea by overthinking it. Just as if you were thinking too hard when you were painting, you'd have killed the painting. You just need to let connect the, the eye to the hand, or almost with the brain, keeping the brain out of it. And similar, a similar thing with the writing, yeah. But, oh, but, but the other thing is that the heat outside and the cool inside suggests some change in her state. State of mind and state of relationship to things, mm. which is very powerful. Yeah. And this That's why I mentioned the conversion. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Very interesting character. She's absent, almost absent from her own story because it's, it's all about everything else. Mm. Painted a wall, and that was the last painting I've done in a long time. So, <laughs> no, that's fine. I'm actually get it on the paper. I feel like this is an achievement. <laughs> um, so, the, I don't know if you can see the comment that's up too. I quite like the little houses in the background. I quite like the, um, I forget what we call them, the dividers of the beach. So, they were quite common. And then the people are just dots because they're kind of irrelevant. They're just things in the scenery, a bit like the trees. Um, but the, the nice coloured, different little huts and shacks that kind of lined the tree line, I thought were really interesting. So that's kind of what I spent time on. And then I uh, decided that it was perfect and couldn't be improved on, so I did some doodles in the box. Um, so, yeah. um, then, so when I actually went back and looked at it, what I found was there was a, there was a really nice little pipe in the corner, but no one seems to be paying any attention to it. The wind force empire as the cries of our playing children and the ever crashing rolling of the waves echoed against his sail. Uh, his tail twisted and danced under him as though teasing gravity higher the kite flew. Excellent. Um, Thank you. Um, okay. let, let, can we have Jack's picture at the front? I think the interesting thing, Jack, is it was the kite that made me take the photograph. <laughs> so how do you get into that? Because it's not noticeable, is it? It looks better at a distance, I think. <laughs> it's, it's, um, as a painting, it's totally a beach scene, isn't it? You've got all the elements there. Even got the Norfolk mud in there, the right-hand side. And what I liked is the little doodles as well, the afterthoughts. At that point, you were sort of inventing things from what you were doing and exploring the medium. And I thought those were interesting. I quite like this dramatic thing here, the black thing. Uh, as a scene, it's, it's exactly a holiday scene. And I think that could go anywhere. Royal Academy next year. <laughs> in terms of the writing, it was really so atmospheric. You created that scene in such a few words and you left those gaps I was talking about. You gave a few details and then we went to this kite and its tails twisting as though defi I can't remember what words you used. I should have noted them down about gravity. What was the phrase you used about gravity, Jack? Uh, teasing. teasing gravity. The the w verb that one would normally use would be defying gravity, but teasing is so much more what kites do. Playing with. They're playing with it because pl flights, um, kites plummet, don't they? And so teasing is just such a good verb choice. And it's 
times like that, I think, yeah, you didn't need to have written anything else, but that tail teasing gravity is absolutely outstanding in the middle of that. Beautiful, beautifully observed. Thank you very much indeed. Oh, I'm having such a lovely time today, said Harry to himself. He stood gazing at all the fruit on the stall in front of him. I'm so glad my friend told me to get a bus pass, he thought. I've been out every day. Today he had travelled to Norwich and was wandering around the market stalls. Those oranges smell lovely. I'll get some and some bananas. He pulled its coat closer around him, glad he had put it on, his thick blue coat as the air was cold. Cup of tea next, he thought, then home on the bus. Another grand day out. For free. <laughs> Brilliant. Wow, thank goodness for bus passes. Eh? OK, Dad. Well, it, 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 the coldness came through when, when uh, Hazel put that blue mop on it. And it, it, it's, it speaks to me of an autumn market. Whereas that might be some, but that doesn't matter because it's how you've seen it and how you've given it to us. And I like the idea of the, um, Ruth will talk about the writing, but the writing is very powerful and that you've derived it from that image is very mm. clever. Mm. It, it's very well painted. It's a, as a market painting, it's fantastically good. Even got the oranges in there. You've got everything in there, the trees and the shadow and the people. Very good. Yeah. Yeah, what what you did really nicely there was broaden out this this man. He was so pleased he'd been convinced to get a bus pass. That mm. to me tells me age, sort of age, you know, an age range. Um, it tells me that he's got someone who cares sufficiently about him to encourage him to live his life and to get out a bit. The fact that someone's had to perhaps persuade him to get out he indicates to me that perhaps he's been in a situation where for a while he was reluctant to be sociable maybe so to me that might hint that you know maybe he's he's on his own after a little while of being with someone mm -hmm. or or just you know maybe working was sufficient and he had to create a new present for himself you know in terms of the, the present of his life so You've, you've indicated to me quite a lot about his backstory just through that one um, detail. The other thing that you picked out in your, um, uh, your the writing, which you've also picked out in the painting, is the oranges and the lemons and the smell. And those are what attracts his attention, the smell of, smell of that. You've also created a very positive character. This is someone who is going to really take the positives. He's, he likes the smell of the oranges and lemons. He, yes, he feels cold and he's got his blue coat on, like that little detail blue, because that blue, of course, is a cold colour. And of course, to me, as a reader reading the blue coat, I'm seeing blue now in my head because that's the colour I've been given. And so I get a sense of coldness from that, just in the same way as you do from a painting. And so that worked really very, very nicely indeed for me. But the, in, see how very lightly, when we talk about more is less, just by saying his friend or someone convinced him to get a bus pass, see how much I've added in there. Uh, uh, sorry, less is more. I said it the wrong way around there. Less is more. That's all you needed to do in order for me to add the rest of it. When I said, add, you know, let the reader add 50%, you've let me add 75% there. Um, I might have it right, I might have it wrong, but as the story progresses, I would find that out. Okay, so I know... We all went to the salty watering place today. The stony ground was a bit tough on my toes. There were lots of strangers out today. A lot of them were walking into a weird floating thing. I don't know why. My, my little friend was very happy today. She shared her ice cream with me and I looked at the penny little dribbles that she missed. Once the crowd had disappeared in the weird floating thing, Dad surprised me with my favourite tennis ball. Today was a tiring but fun day with my lovely family. Dad. Uh, it's it's exactly sums up the place, doesn't it? It's uh, it's the uh, the beach, the pit we know it so well, the hills beyond, the boat taking people on board, and of course there's a dog. But it's it's it absolutely sums up the place. Brilliant. Completely convincing to me. Do you know in terms of the, I I did not know that you were writing dog. 
and then the salty watery place and the bits on the and immediately you got the salty watery place and the bits on on the feet I thought uh, we're dog because this is where we're talking about voice Nigel earlier it's it is not per people voice that's that's a sophisticated um, sort of um, observation so it but it doesn't feel like a child uh, you know so it doesn't feel like a child so immediately I was thinking who is telling me this story and then we get there they're going and and um, allowed to share some ice cream or lick the ice cream that fell and, and all the rest of it that worked really nicely but what really interests me about that piece is the dog is talking about the world around them the person who's telling the story is almost absent from the scene and I feel it's the same way and that is just so dog dogs are not self-aware are they and it's the same with and so they will be telling about everything else and everything else in this painting is important but it's this this almost in, invisible dog whose story it is and I thought you did that capture that really well that sense of dog you've captured it really nicely in the painting the dog's not important it's all the stuff around and it's the same in that piece of writing essence of dog but the salty watery place and the, the stones under the feet and the ice cream and yeah the happy day that this dog's had out. Um, I, I really, um, rather than write the story, I've been, I took off literally, and I've, I've sort of sketched out uh, things that might contribute to a story in the next yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so, Early morning outside a runway station, somebody else said that. What it is about railway stations, but it has to be early morning for some reason. Um, the smell of coffee, pastries, trains, slight odd perfumes, but faint. Um, people with luggage, trundling sounds, looking for spare seats, trying to attract the waitress. She is capable but harassed. She's been there since first thing. The sound of different languages all mixed up, and trees sowing sowing in the background. The, the, the use of the umbrella rolled up is very interesting, isn't it? She echoes in size, the, the umbrella in a sense. She's a very dominant figure. She, although she's a servant to the other people, she's very much in charge. It's, I think it's a bit about woman's lib myself. I think she's, she's saying, bloody students, why they all want coffee now? I'm fed up. I've been on my shift, you're right. I've been on my shift all day, my feet are hurting. And it, that all comes through from that painting. I think that's powerful. It, yeah, and I really, do you know what you said? Oh, these are, these are notes to build towards something. You've got sufficient of her in those notes to absolutely intrigue me about her. You've built the world and this is how, how do we tell the story? You created the bigger world and then you put her in there and I've absolutely got her. And the, the language is swirling around her, the smells swirling around her. I thought that was really interesting because what we do in writing is this zooming thing. Bigger world, slightly smaller image within it, person within that thought within that that zooming in and to me that's what you've done you created this world and then you've put her in it and so the minute as in as in this painting she stands out as the focal attention doesn't she because mm. you've done that and within that because she's the human being that has been identified I'm now focusing in on her in terms of the writing I know it's her story I want to find out more about her and I want to find out what more about you know what else is going on in her life, what she thinks of her situation, how she's enjoying it or not enjoying it, all that sort of stuff. I'm really interested in her. And it's that thing you've given the big picture. It's like um, the rolling landscape, a tree on the top of a hill, a little boy sitting under the tree, a tear on the end of his nose. What am I doing here, he thinks. You see that zooming in? And to me, that's what you've, you've done here. You create this world, this image, this feeling, this atmosphere, absolutely in it. And then you say, and here's this person. And so whilst it might feel like bullet points in the same way, I don't think it would take much to say, this is, this is it. I'm, I'm opening the world up and then focusing in, zooming in, just as you would in a film to, to the, what, the point that's being made. That's marvellous. But Nigel's chucked in a railway station. Which yeah, 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 of course. Everyone's got railway stations. <laughs> That's marvellous.
Thank you very much. Well, I know Bob you always used to talk, and I always found it intrigued me, you always used to talk about the backstory of the painting. Yeah. yeah. And it, 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 that, that really sunk in to me because I like every painting I look at now, I, or do, I try and think about the, the backstory. You know, yes. Like, yes. Yeah. needs to be seen from afar. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, it's far enough. It's fine. So to start with, I was fascinated by the three heads together, um, three men together. And I thought, whoa, somebody's going to get left out. And is, this a, a comp is there going to be competition between the men? Um, but then I clicked in and I realised what, what was going on. So I'm, in my story, I'm the man and I've just, who's standing, um, he's just crossed a busy high street, he's carrying his weekend paper, he's thinking, oh, it'll be full of bad news again, I suppose. <laughs> and he closes up on a sort of quiet park-like area against these fascinating table because he wants to see what the focus is. Chess, he thinks. That's what I need, mindfulness. This, you know, these long pauses between the moves. It's so peaceful. Then he noticed the man in the red shirt is looking at his mobile phone. Bloody hell, he thinks, um, to quote Simon Reed. <laughs> really, who I'm in we love understand. with at the moment. Um, um, is he getting this sort of flat news flashes? Has he got a, one of these apps that shows what, where the latest disaster is? And, you know, the other two are finding him a bit of a pest, I think, um, because he's trying to disrupt the concentration of his neighbour. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> this is reminds me very much of Renoir's painting of the, the people, people under in the, the tree. Yeah, in the cafe. In scene. the cafe. Yeah. Oh my God! It's yeah. full of life. The people are very well defined. I, I can even see the faces, although they're not there. The group of people behind, they, they would be girls in costume in Renoir's painting. And the, the man has got a newspaper. I've never even noticed never that. Noticed. Yeah, well, I'm just going to say this about the writing, is that what you've done is it introduced two groups of people to me, the chess players who are engaged in their world and the, the men who might be relating to the outside world. Mm. But Ruth will enlarge upon that, no doubt. E excellent painting. I mean, it's a fantastic painting. What I absolutely loved about that... Um, the, the piece you, you, you spoke about, his story, um, was the idea that he um, has... The outside world has been really... The bigger world has been really troubling him in many ways. And so he's gone and got his newspaper because he's a man of habit and he will get his newspaper because that's what he does. So you're, you're telling me a whole heap about him to begin with. But he is troubled by the outside world. And then he sees in the middle of the world this moment of peace, this moment where people are not thinking about anything outside. And for a moment he thinks, there is another way. I can, in my smaller world, control my little world for now. And I do that by just being in this moment and watching these people in this peaceful moment. But then this other person opens up the outside world and it starts flooding in on him again. He is very concerned about what's going on, and I think that might be a representation of him being concerned about what's going on in his life outside this moment. But in a moment, for a moment in the middle of his day, he had a moment of peace. And to capture that moment of peace so nicely in terms of the writing um, was really a nice thing, a really great thing to do, because it showed me that this person, does, he's troubled, and he doesn't want to be troubled. And yet the thing he reaches out for is only ephemeral and it's sort of quite quite realistic in a way that the you know one can search for happiness but actually it's the um, okay bits on the way through that really matter and it's sort of representation of of, of life as it is i, I, I love I, I, this I, I, I,